Hello everyone, I'm Brian. Today I'm going to be reacting to four past life stories of Sadhguru. Sadhguru was born as Bilva, the snake charmer, 400 years ago. Okay, so this was a request. So the request, if you have requests, please leave in the comments below. Please leave the title of the video, the channel, and the length. That way I can search for it and add it. If you leave the link to the video in the chat, YouTube might flag it or held it for review and I might not see it. So just in case, just leave the words. Okay, so let me go ahead and put out my biases out there. I, I do this generally at the beginning of every video, or at least I try to. I don't, I don't ever say it's my biases, but it is my biases. So do I believe in reincarnation? I do not. Um, my worldview is a duality, not non-duality so far. Um, but that doesn't mean I don't want to learn these things. And I, trust me, I do understand a non-duality's perspective. I, I, do I 100% understand it? I don't know. <laughs> Honestly, probably not. Uh, it's safe to say that I don't. Even the duality world of you, I understand it, but I doubt I understand it completely too. So, um, now that's not to say that, um, how do I say this? This is the one thing that I, I come up with, a phrase that will explain why, is extraordinary claims requires extraordinary evidence. That's been said by a scientist, I can't remember his name, but, um, and the only way I can believe in reincarnation, if there is a way someone can, someone can explain or point out things that no one else has yet to discover, for example, say I, I say I, I was reincarnated and I was like, oh, I remember my past life and and I, I, I grab this group of scientists or whatever and we go out and document this entire thing. I go out to this place that no one's ever been to. There's no significance to this place. It's like, yeah, if you dig right there, it's about 20 feet deep, you'll see a tool and I, I describe the tool and when they dig it all out, and they grab the tool and it's like, wow, it's, it's described exactly as you say, and they carbon date it, and it's in fact old. It's say 400 years old. That way, it's not there's that way it's not proof that I just dug up the hole, put it there. You know, it's not oh, it's only five minutes old, and clearly that you did not do this. You know, 400 years old. And then they go to another spot. It's like, yeah, this is a tent over here. So they dig 20 feet down again. They bring up some tattered cloth and the carbon date. It's 400 years old. And it looks to be in the shape of a tent or something, something like that, you know, where no one's been. And they can verify that. That would be astounding. <laughs> and I've seen this one video where there was a woman, or I'm sorry, it was uh, Mr. Ballin on YouTube. I did watch a lot of his stuff, like practically everything and he talked about this woman who described a lot of things about ancient Egypt about the walls and the decors and whenever they went there to look for it they've never been in this chamber but when they opened up this chamber it was everything she described and I if I remember correctly no one's been in there but she described it perfectly so that was kind of strange but this is not something that happens very common it's not like everyone's doing this so that's weird to say anyway let's go ahead and start I said too much already uh, let's go. Disclaimer. Okay. Before questioning on the authenticity of the information in this video, please read chapter 3 from the book Sadhguru More Than a Life or the last chapter from the book Death and Inside Story. Hello viewers, welcome to Life Tricks. What you are about to see is the story of Sadhguru's past life. After his enlightenment on the hills of Chamundi, within 5 years, Sadhguru was able to retrieve almost all the memories of his past life from his subconscious. During his yoga programs, as a precursor for the creation of Dhyanalinga, Sadhguru revealed his past life stories to his closest disciples. Details of the same are mentioned in his biography, Sadhguru More Than a Life and his book Death An Inside Story. In the year 1996, in the middle of Dhyanalinga creation, Sadhguru decided to trace his past life. Though Sadhguru had the vivid memories of the past life, he had no idea where he was going. He was only following his intuitions and guiding the driver. Finally, they reached a small village of Madhya Pradesh. There was a tree. Even after 400 years have passed, it still stood there as a witness to bondage, love, hatred and awareness. It is from here the story unfolds. A 400-year-old Raigad district, now in Madhya Pradesh. 
there lived a snake charmer bilwa a tall well built fearless young man full of life he was a rebel by birth an arrogant rule breaker he was too wild to fit into the society society couldn't withstand this at the same time bilwa was a shiva devotee he loved snakes Bilwa belonged to a tribe of snake charmers who were also fortune tellers. They used to sing songs in early mornings in the streets. They traveled from place to place. They were peace loving people. Money and wealth had no meaning in their lives. For Bilwa, love meant more than his life. He always thought from the heart, not from the mind. At the times caste system was at its peak, he fell in love with a Brahmin girl, Shambhavi. It was from here his life destined to have a tragic ending. Bilwa and Shambhavi's love made the upper caste people furious and their anger turned upon Bilwa's whole clan. To protect his people from the anger of the society, he moved them to Sambalpur, which is now in modern day Orissa. But this was not the only reason. In Sambalpur, there was a Mukteswar temple of his beloved Shiva. Why did they hate him? Or is it just him or them because of that? Oh, caste system. <clears throat> I, but the thing is, though, they never explain whether she was like a, a higher caste. And which would be still kind of weird. I, I mean, I, I don't quite understand the caste system. I, I heard many explanations, but... Um, but I guess even then, everyone cared that you marry within your own caste system. So there's two different caste systems that I understand. One is in terms of if you were born in the lower class, you stay in the lower class. In middle class, you stay in the middle class. Upper class, you stay in the upper class. The second cat oh, there's actually like multiples of them that have been explained throughout uh, my, uh, my videos. The next one is <clears throat> the caste system in terms of your job. So if you're a woodworker, you stay in the woodwork, which does make sense here. If you're an ironsmith, you work in an ironsmith because tools... Um, equipment are so expensive that generally tools and stuff get passed down to their children so it makes sense that the the children learns to trade because their father knows to trade and it's kind of difficult to learn from someone else during the time it's much easier to, to pass down knowledge from father to son or from daughter to um, from daughter to mother <laughs> from mother to daughter or whatever way you pass down information and the other system was oh man did I just forget about it Last names, I believe it was. It was names. At least I heard it that way. I'm not sure. I, f I forget that didn't really stick in my mind, but I do remember it being um, dealing with your names and more than likely still associated with the work. So your last name was based on, I guess, maybe what kind of work you did. This <clears throat> did not stop two young lovers from meeting. Bilva knew villages, fields, and forest inch by inch. So the lovers started meeting secretly there. But this secret didn't remain a secret for long. Shambhavi's family and community found out about this. They threatened Bilva in various ways. But nothing mattered for a 27-year-old fearless Bilva. He literally knew no fear. He was planning to elope with the girl he loved. Shambhavi's family decided to end this somehow. Shambhavi's uncle took the help of a local king. They came to know a secret meeting two lovers had planned on a full moon day in the jungle. Shambhavi's family used this secret meeting as a trap. A group led by her uncle were hiding in the forest. Bilva was unaware of this and came for the meeting. Before he could understand what was going on, all the men from Shambhavi's community surrounded him and tied him to a tree. They let loose one of his own snakes on him. Shambhavi stood there beside his lover as a helpless witness for all this horror. The cobra bit him. Snake's venom started passing through Bilva's veins, thickening the blood. Within few minutes, poison was all over his body. He could feel his lungs collapsing. Breathing became difficult. An intolerable pain was rising. At that moment, Bilva saw those people who did this to him. They were enjoying his painful death. So he decided not to give them the pleasure of watching him die. He started watching his breath as death was approaching him. Within a moment, Bilva fell down. He left his body in full awareness. 
For him, it was no more a tragic death. It was a graceful exit. Shambhavi stood there, weeping in great agony beside the dead body of the man she loved, Bilva, the snake charmer. Lovers were separated. Bilva's life ended. But the story didn't end there. Creation had more to tell. So I was I was about to say like I was gonna stop it, but I decided not to go on. Um, I was wondering if Bilva felt like he was betrayed, but clearly he saw that she was there crying and weeping. And then, uh, the question I actually had from earlier on uh, was, what about Sadhguru's wife? Uh, is that is she reincarnated from um, from her? Or I don't know the other stories. Uh, I'm assuming that all well, four past lives. So this is his fifth one. Then it's living currently. So have they all been reincarnated to meet? It'd be quite a tragic story to, to maybe see that, you know, they could never fall in love because always something's interfering. And then, at least I know today, I do believe that Guru to be married with someone and don't think anything tragic happened. Then again, I don't really know his story too well. This explains the deep connection Sadhguru has with snakes since his childhood. Sadhguru still has the birthmark of snake bite as a legacy of past life on his shoulder. Hmm. It is also revealed by Sadhguru that Shambhavi also reincarnated as Bharati, Sadhguru's close disciple in present life. As we saw, Bilva left his body in full awareness. As a result of this, when Bilva was born again, he was born as a spiritual seeker. He was Shiva Yogi. Shiva Yogi was born in a Telugu speaking family. He travelled from place to place and lived a life of suffering and hunger. But his sadhana was intense and severe. It had the touch of venom from previous birth. Sadhguru recalls this lifetime as a lifetime of painful and heartbreaking punishment that Shiva Yogi imposed on himself. Shiva Yogi spent most of his time on the mountains of Velayangiri. He died at a very young age of 25. Shiva Yogi was born again third time. What killed him uh, the second time around? I mean, I guess he just punished himself to death? This lifetime also, people called him Shiva Yogi. This time, he achieved mastery over the occult science, achieved many states of Samadhi through intense sadhana. Because of this, a large number of people became his followers. But after all these achievements and intense sadhana, Shiva Yogi was still far away from enlightenment. It was a very painful moment in Shiva Yogi's life and his heart was about to break. He also decided to leave the body and search for the ultimate. It is in such a time his Guru appeared. One day when Shiva Yogi sat meditating on the mountains, a yogi came that way. He was none other than Palani Swami. He saw Shiva Yogi and within a moment he saw his pain and longing for enlightenment. Shiva Yogi was a Shiva devotee. Palani Swami knew this. He knew Shiva Yogi will not accept anything that comes from anyone other than Shiva. Out of his compassion, he appeared in front of Shiva Yogi as Adi Yogi himself. Shiva Yogi saw this and he surrendered completely to him. Palani Swami then placed his walking stick on Shiva Yogi's forehead. That was it. Shiva Yogi attained enlightenment. Suffering of his lifetimes ended. After this, Guru Palani Swami went on his way without saying a word. Guru and disciple never met again in their lifetime after this meeting of few minutes. There was more than this. Palani Swami identified Shiva Yogi as the person suitable for the creation of Dhyanalinga and transferred the whole complex technology of Dhyanalinga creation when he placed his walking stick on Shiva Yogi's forehead. Dhyanalinga was the dream of many yogis. Thousands of yogis had tried and failed. It was nearly impossible project <coughs> that would free the whole humanity. I do remember this from uh, Sadhguru himself talking about that. I, I don't remember him saying that he was a different person, I don't believe. Maybe maybe I did? I, I don't quite remember. Creation of Dhanalinga was not an easy task. Lives of people who attempted it 
always ended in tragedy it needed participation of large number of men and women in an intense spiritual practice society didn't accept it they opposed shiva yogi in all possible way despite his vigorous effort shiva yogi failed to fulfill his guru's dream he died at the age of 57 but his mission didn't end there sadguru says if his guru didn't had given him the responsibility of dhyanalinga he would have attained mahasamadhi in the lifetime of shiva yogi itself there wouldn't be a jaggi vasudev but to only fulfill his guru's dream he had to come back two more times Shiva Yogi for okay. I'm trying. I'm trying to keep up with the lives here. So it's basically Bilva, I believe. Yeah, Bilva, uh, Shiva Yogi died at 25. Then Shiva Yogi at 57, and this is the fourth one. Shiva Yogi knew if he was not able to fulfill his Guru's will in this lifetime, he had to take birth again and start again. There was no escape for him. So in the early part of 20th century, he came back. now as sadguru shri brahma he was a fiery yogi born in telugu speaking family he started sadhana at an early age and acquired great siddhis it was the time of british rule in india also the time of world war 2 british had prohibited crossing the tracks of nearby railway station in kunur shri brahma was living in an ashram at that time he did what was prohibited he crossed the railway tracks when british police saw this they immediately arrested him shri brahma walked through the locked prison gate news of this miracle spread like a wildfire throughout the nilgiri region it created a large number of disciples shri brahma was an arrogant ungodly man he often abused gods a huge crowd was gathered near uti lake to listen to him crowd became furious after hearing such comments from shri brahma When the situation became out of control and was turning into violence, Sri Brahma called a 11-year-old boy from the crowd and placed his hand on boy's head and asked him to walk on the lake. To crowd's astonishment, the boy walked on the lake. Everyone became silent in a moment. By these kind of miracles, Sadguru Sri Brahma's followers grew day by day. He was not nice to people. They were afraid of him for his anger. At the same time, they couldn't stop loving him. Sri Brahma established 70 ashrams wherever he went across Tamil Nadu in a very short span of time. Finally, he reached Coimbatore and started with the only aim of his life. Sri Brahma did whatever he could do to establish Dhyanalinga. When people from orthodox society saw men and women in intense proximity, their anger turned against Sri Brahma. Sri Brahma was thrown out of Coimbatore. With violent anger, Sri Brahma walked for several days. One of his loyal disciple Vibhuti also walked along with him. It was not easy for him to match his guru's speed. Whenever they passed any village, Vibhuti would collect the provisions from the villagers and cook good food for his guru. Once his guru went into meditative state, he would quietly go there and keep the food in front of him. and hiding in a far away place he would watch his guru eating the food he had to do all this in between sadguru's speedy walk this made his tasks even more difficult but vibhuti always took care not to increase the fury of his master who was already in a raging anger guru and disciple walked day and night relentlessly and finally reached a place kadappa which is now in andhra pradesh there they took a shelter in small someshwar temple shri brahma chose this place since his guru palani swami had spent some time in this temple in his lifetime why was he so angry i did i miss it i, I don't i must have missed it if he explained it but i don't, i don't understand why he was so angry here they were not welcomed well because the temple priest and his assistants couldn't adjust to the intensity of their presence here both guru and disciple plotted a plan for 6 months it was a plan for next lifetime if they failed to establish dhyanalinga in this lifetime they wanted to make sure in next lifetime at least there shouldn't be any impediments to dhyanalinga creation 
they selected more than two dozens of people a plan was made so that in next lifetime where exactly they should be born what skills they should acquire this time shri brahma wanted to place them in such families from where there was much opposition to the creation of dhanalinga he thought if the people from such families are themselves involved in the creation there will not be much resistance it was later revealed by sadguru that vibhuti was none other than the past life of bharati who was also shambhavi in the lifetime of bilva whatever the plan may be it was obvious that creation of dhanalinga will have its own impediments everything was set but shri brahma anyhow wanted to fulfill his guru's will as soon as possible in this lifetime only as a desperate act to fulfill his guru's dream he made a final attempt in the western india in the vajreshwari ashram there was a bala yogi sadananda he had attained enlightenment at the age of 11 he had spent 3 years in samadhi after that sadananda had just left his body at the age of 26 When Sri Brahma came to know this he didn't want to miss the opportunity Sadananda's body was carefully prepared body because of his sadhana at an early age Sri Brahma went inside Balayogi's body at the same time he stayed in two bodies his plan was to prepare few loyal disciples who can fulfill his guru's dream but Sri Brahma only got disappointment situation here was also no different than that of Coimbatore disappointed shri brahma left the body of balayogi and returned to his own and started preparing for his own departure at the age of 42 another lifetime failed it seemed like palani swami's dream would remain as a dream only shri brahma knew the reason for failure his lack of social skills he still wanted to check whether there was anything wrong in his energies he went back to velengiri ascended the seventh hill and left his body through all seven chakras such a person is called chakreshwara such an act was done by shiva himself it is said that even today energy there is still alive before ascending the seventh hill he stopped the disciples following him at the foot hills and announced i will be back he kept the promise he came back as jaggi vasudev Though everything was planned in the lifetime of Sri Brahma it was not an easy task for Sadguru to create Dhanalinga he says this time i civilized myself to handle the society properly which Sri Brahma lacked after several hardships Sadguru was able to establish Dhanalinga in this lifetime Sadguru have said this this is his last life and he will never return again since his purpose is fulfilled he will also ascend the seven hill for one last time and he will be no more so this was the story of four past lives of sadguru thanks for watching <coughs> so hold on um let me go back real quick i can't remember that word um that the, the d word uh Dihana Linga. So he he filled uh, his master's dreams then. I mean, I I thought that was to If I remember correctly from Sadguru's video, isn't that to create the perfect being? Or am I wrong? Or am I just I'm trying to remember a lot of things here. I'm learning a lot super fast or well, there's a lot of information. <laughs> I don't know whether I'm learning it or not correctly. So uh, I kind of depend on you guys to correct me when I'm wrong. <laughs> But this was supposed to be the creation of a perfect being, correct? And well, at least according to him, I guess he did in fact uh finish that dream of his master's dream, should I say? So did said guru really say that he's not going to come back? Like he's once he's he's done, he's done. So that's kind of that's kind of interesting. Like and I mean that kind of sucks. I mean, even though I don't believe in reincarnation, but if he can come back, <laughs> I'd like him to come back for sure. Um 
It's, it's kind of it's kind of weird. How do you how do you choose how do you get? You can choose to come back, and you can choose not to come back. Well, let's. So I think of Brahman and Atman again. I, I I don't know if I fully grasped that yet, even though I think I do. As in everything's Brahman, including karma. I believe everything, all emotions, intangible, intangible things is Brahman, if I understand correctly. So, technically we are said Guru as well. But, I don't know where I was going with that one. It was just going along the lines, it's like, I don't know, I guess I'm fighting why he doesn't want to come back. And how does he choose not to come back? Because, we are all the same, so it's 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 kind of like it's, I guess in my mind it's kind of like you you don't necessarily have a choice. You just because we're all one conscious, every child that's born is essentially all of us, or the one conscious in terms of the uh, non duality world view. So we are said guru, and the child that gets born the day that said guru finally passes away will be said guru as well. It will be me and you and everyone else. Again, let me know if I'm misunderstanding this, because I, I, I say this in hopes that if if I'm wrong, you correct me. If I'm right, or well, you don't have to say I'm right. You can say like, well, you got it, but it's a little wrong or something. Just let me know if I'm anywhere near off. But yeah, we are all set, Guru. We are all, but this goes back to, um, oh my god, I, I, I was writing up comments and I had this word memorized. Oh god, it's the bucket of water thing again. God, I need to, say, I need to keep repeating that word. Take a picture of it so I can remember it. But it's these uh, experience, your experience, your, your experiences in this life gets passed down from one body to the next. So I'm assuming that's what he means by the the experience that said guru, uh, this person called said guru, even though it's Brahman, will no longer be reincarnated into a new body. But the true consciousness, the pure consciousness, will be obviously in all of us, including said guru, but the samsara? I don't know if that's it. Started with an S though. But the, the experiences of said guru will not be reborn. I'm assuming that's what he's meaning, that that essence of this false Javatman will not be re reincarnated. This is very complicated stuff. <laughs> Alright, that's my reaction to four past life stories of said guru. If you like my content, please consider subscribing, thumbs up, thumbs down, and below. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next vid.